Hi, and welcome to this clip going through Progress Test 5 2020. There's a few selected questions that seem to present a challenge to many people, so I'll go through those particular ones uh, and leave the rest for people to go and have a look at themselves. It's important you've had a look at this uh, test yourself and try to, to self-correct it first before you go any further. Um, but if you have done so and you've only got some help and you want maybe a little bit of extra sort of insight into one or two of the questions, then please feel free to use this clip to help you. So you have two separate solutions as described in the question. Let's think about each one in turn. You've got sodium chloride and sodium carbonate. So looking at the uh, two solutions, the total number of sodium ions provided is 3, if you take it per unit of NaCl or Na2CO3. So what they want is the total concentration of sodium ions in the mixture formed. So concentration suggests using the formula N equals V times C. We obviously need to rearrange it so that concentration is a subject. And then thinking about the total volume, because we're looking for the total concentration, we know this is, this is 200 centimeters cubed because we've got two separate 100 centimeter cubed samples of the different solutions. Okay, so the thing to do now is to work out how we can get the uh, number of moles of sodium ions from each of the individual solutions. So you take the volume of each solution separately first and do uh, divide it by a thousand and then multiply that by its concentration it gives you 0 0.02 in each case. So thinking about the number of moles of sodium ions from each of those solutions, uh, one mole of NaCl makes um, uh, one mole of Na+. Plus. Uh, but one mole of Na2CO3 makes uh, 0.04, 0.04 moles of Na+, so you get 0.06 in total. So doing the concentration equals moles over volume, you can easily work out that 0.3 moles per decimeter cubed is the total concentration, so that, for, that therefore gives us um, answer C. So let's go now to do uh, the next selected question. So this question... This is 10C. Asks us to consider the structure and bonding in bromine and how this accounts for its relatively low melting point. So the first thing to do is to mention the intermolecular forces that are present in bromine and then to state that they're between bromine molecules. So the only other thing you need to say is that those London forces are weak so require little energy to break. There's actually very little you have to say here but you have to be quite specific in the way you say it. So let's go on to the next part of question 10. So I'm not going to do part E that you can see at the bottom of the, the screen because most people manage to cope with that. Um, so part D is where a lot of people struggled. So the key to this is thinking about breaking your answer up into sections that you can deal with a bit at a time. So I'd suggest maybe doing a section on your mercury 2 bromide and then a section on your mercury metal. So with the mercury 2 bromide, because it's an ionic solid, it'll be ions that are the charge carriers. So in a solid form it can't do this, can't conduct, because the ions are fixed in place and don't carry charge as a result. When they're molten, when the substructure is broken up, the ions are mobile so they can move around and carry charge now. Now in mercury is a metal, like any other metal, has delocalized electrons in both solid and liquid states. So what happens is the delocalized electrons can move around in both states, solid and liquid, so therefore they can act as charge carriers and the mercury conducts. So in this question, uh, they want you to work out the systematic name of compound A. So to do this, I need to do two things. I need to work out um, how many carbons are in the longest carbon chain. There are seven. And uh, it's an alcohol because of the OH functional group. So I need to decide where my locant numbers are. In other words, um, the positions on the chain of where my methyl group is and where my OH group is. So I count from left to right because that's the end, the left-hand side, that is, that's uh, closest to the functional group, my, um, my alcohol group. So it's going to be heptanol, but we need to say whereabouts the OH group is. So it's on carbon number 3, so heptan 3 ol and there's a methyl group at carbon number 4. So therefore I can call it 
um, 4 methyl heptan 3 ol. So then it says compound D reacts readily with hydrogen chloride in an addition reaction. But it's important to remember that that doesn't mean the ring breaks because it's only the, the pi bond in the double bond that is broken, not the sigma bond. So therefore the structure, the ring structure, is maintained. See, there's two possibilities as to why the chlorine could be sorry, added on. It could either be added on at uh, the carbon next to the C double bond O or two carbons away. So the next thing to do is pop over to the, the following page. So remembering that you, um, you were dealing with an alkene, it must mean that Markovnikov's rule is in, in play here because it says which of the two possible products will be formed in greater amounts. So thinking of the two structures that you've got, you've got to move backwards through the mechanism and then think, did I have a secondary carbocation or a tertiary carbocation? So looking at the structures of the haloalkanes that are actually made as a result and thinking backwards to the um, carbocation that would have led to those, you can now decide which one it's going to be. So it's going to be the tertiary structure. So therefore, now what you've got to do is explain why this is formed in greater amounts. So all you need to really say is the tertiary carbocation is more stable than the secondary carbocation. And as such, this is more likely to form. So now let's move down to the calculation part. So moving the page down. So it says 4.125 grams of compound D. So let's think about compound D. So we need to get a picture of it from the previous page. So working out that its molar mass is 110 grams per mole. So the first thing to do is to work out the number of moles of compound D that we have, which is 0 0.0375. So we also have to think of the product that's formed. Uh, so its molar ratio is 146.5 grams per mole, and it's formed in equal amounts to the original D. So the molar ratio, N to D, the number of moles of D to the number of moles of product is 1 to 1. So 0 0.0375 molar products, two of them, one made in 90, 0.95 and one made in 0.05 ratio. So therefore that's your 95% to 5% that the question is talking about. So what you've got to do is multiply the number of moles that are made times the ratio times the 146.5. And that gives you the grams, the mass in other words, of each of the two possible products. Okay, so let's now move on to the final question that I've selected for this clip. And that's the level response one on ion testing. Okay, so there's quite a lot to process here, so let's have a think about what the question is giving us first before we go anywhere. So the list of solutions are the things that the solutions might be. So therefore it's one of ammonium sulfate, sodium sulfate, sodium chloride and potassium bromide. The next set of bullet points tell you what reagents you can use. So don't start bringing in ones that you've learnt about but that aren't listed here. And then finally, uh, it tells you what's already been done, so don't waste your time talking about the sulphate test because it's been done already. So just to sort of emphasize that, you should include all of the things that you're asked to. Don't leave anything out. So I'd suggest again breaking it down into its component parts. So I'm going to split the page down the middle and on the left hand side I'm going to have the test and on the right hand side I'm going to have the observation. So to deal with chloride ions, to identify them, you add AgNO3, a silver nitrate solution, whereupon you get a white precipitate. And if you add dilute NH3 after that, dilute ammonia, the white precipitate dissolves. So doing the same for um, bromide, you get a cream precipitate, but this time you have to add concentrated NH3 uh, to make the precipitate dissolve. 
and finally to test for the ammonium ion. So testing for the ammonium ion. So to test for the ammonium ion, you need to warm it with uh, sodium hydroxide uh, solution, and then uh, if damp red litmus paper is held above, you should be getting it turning blue. The damp red litmus paper turns blue from the evolution of ammonia gas. So that takes us to the end of this clip. Hopefully it gives you a few tips to perhaps take away and apply to similar questions you come across in future. So until then, thanks for listening and see you soon.